Um, well, very quickly, I've had to revise my plans while I was sitting there because I wasn't given an update on Hillsborough. I was gonna, <laughs> I'm joking, I will within it all. But again, once again, it's um, we're stuck because of ongoing court cases. And um, I'm just trying to find my... There, sorry, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, there's, there's two there, yours is the one. The right, yeah, great, okay, thanks. Um, I kind of just thought it might be useful um, because there's a, it, I think it fit together quite nicely tonight um, that I go first and um, Steve and Dave, in terms of what they do, it's logical they follow and then culminating in uh, Pilgrim, giving us, uh, us an update on Grenville and sort of sweeping up on stuff I've said in relation to Hillsborough and um, Grenville. And it's great that, you know, um, I'm, I'm really pleased that Pilgrim is here tonight because we are, she is a former colleague of mine and that's a whole seminar in itself, isn't it, Pilgrim? Uh, but with, that's for another day as well. So it's great and, and it has be, meant that because we, we're friends, uh, we have had that link uh, going down to Grenfell in the early days and Pilgrim was very helpful. Um, as I've said, at the, where it's at at the moment in relation to um, Hillsborough is that, as you know, um, there are going to be six prosecutions um, whether they reach trial is another matter. That's still all up in the air. And um, a scheduled date is 2019 for those cases to proceed. So you see there's no rush and the wheels of um, the legal world turn very slowly indeed. Um, can't obviously, once again, um, we're, we're limited. What, what can be said about that? And I've, said, I've stood here and I've said before, uh, this is no accident. And this will happen equally with Grenfell, that um, procedures um, are put in place and go at such a pace that those most involved do no, don't want to do anything to damage any prosecutions, any outcomes. But we are virtually gagged, in, Hill, in the case of Hillsborough, gagged for many years. And of course then, one of the arguments that can be used in why cases shouldn't proceed is that uh, those um, who have been charged will not receive a fair trial because of what is already in the public domain. Um, and so it, it's a double-edged thing and is very frustrated when you can't say exactly what you want to say. Um, for me, those who know me will know that's even harder. Um, so um, all I'm going to do is run you through. Uh, actually, it's some, some uh, things that have been done before I'm having a great time with this, aren't I? Uh, yeah, okay. Now, um, yeah, that's it now. All I want to do is bring to show the similarities. People have called on them, whatever. And then things I've done previously, there's a few slides in there that I've used previously here, but show how it still fits in. And I thought this was a really good quote uh, because it, it's kind of my thinking on it. In the aftermath of the deadly fire in Grenfell Tower, parallels have been drawn to the deaths of 96 Liverpool fans at Hillsborough. Both disasters have their roots in institutional negligence and a lack of care for working class institutions. And I think that quote will follow on, uh, will fit in nicely with what Steve and Dave will follow on to speak about. Um, because when these disasters occur, inevitably it is um, around the poorest in our society or around the most stereotyped in our society. We, you know, Hillsborough uh, occurred within the context of footballs, within the context of football hooliganism um, in the 80s and uh, the negative reputation of Liverpool, etc. And um, a group of people that were dispensable, really. I mean, that sounds awful, but even when we look at the monetary cost you know, we've said before, the majority that died being of an age, um, be, you know, young adults and largely unemployed, they were worth so little financially. And I forget the exact figure, but what the state paid for their debts was so minimal. And to me, that's always a sad kind of symbol of how people were treated and just what they were worth. Similarly with Grenfell, largely um, very much a, a high proportion of immigrants um, and 
a whole variety of nationalities within uh, that tower block. So when that fits in with the context of present day society and uh, the push to the right, you see how frustrating um, it is and how the similarities are there. Another quote, um, because this to me is the end of it in a little way. And, and he's not here tonight, Ian Byrne, but Ian Byrne um, is a Liverpool supporter involved in Spirit of Shankly and is also a, a colleague now. Um, but after after the announcement that there would be prosecutions, this was in June of this year, um, he wrote this, and I love this quote because this is an ordinary Liverpool supporter from the area, from Anfield, who believes passionately in the community in the area. His father, when he was younger, he was too young actually, his father was a stalwart um, of uh, supporting the campaign, having fundraisers in the pub he ran, etc., etc. And it just goes to the heart of me saying about it being a grassroots campaign. And it was the day that it was announced there would be some prosecutions. And he said, it is times like today when you cherish what the great people from the HJC did for both families and survivors. I'm certain that without them, today wouldn't have happened as they galvanised grassroots support behind the campaign for justice. Undoubtedly, one of the most important institutions in Liverpool over the last three decades and an absolute credit to the city and beyond. And one of the reasons why I like that quote, aside from the fact that I have huge respect for Ian, um, is because he is, you know, your average football supporter, Liverpool person, living in the community. Um, and he knows the truth and he knows right from wrong. And that quote and what he says is a total variance from what is actually happening. He sings the praises of a justice campaign that is being written out of the history of Hillsborough in so many ways. And I'll show how, I'll try and show how that's done. But um, more and more that is happening. I've, I've stood here before and spoken about controlling the narrative and um, this is part and parcel of it and it's incredibly frustrating. So I say that because, you know, um, a lot of people have died along the way as I've said before and so it, you, you need to remember people pay a cost for being involved in things and also as well the value of that. Um, when Hillsborough happened, it was a Tory government. Uh, it was a time of high unemployment, of strikes. Uh, there was the planned implementation of ID cards. It was within the context of football hooliganism, as I've said. And there was this general neg negative reputation of Liverpool as a city and specifically of Liverpool supporters. Um, specifically following on from Heysel. If you just go through that, you can pick out how that's relevant to wanting, uh, the context in which Grenfell happened, substitute Theresa May for Margaret Thatcher. And as you know, someone said in relation to this, um, the only good thing about, uh, for the people, uh, the survivors and the bereaved of um, Grenfell was that Theresa May was reticent and reluctant to go the poor Hillsborough survivors had Margaret Thatcher thrust upon them the next day. She couldn't wait to get to Sheffield to make sure it was all being covered up. And um, I think there are people here tonight, certainly these people I know, whom she went to their bed as they were in one of the various hospitals. Um, but you see that Tory government, um, but it, you know, I would argue increasingly further to the right than the government that we uh, suffered under Thatcher. There is all, also high unemployment. The government might try to tell you differently, but we know only too well how to lie with statistics and the number of people on zero-hour contracts um, in precarious work. Uh, the whole notion of people uh, being bussed into working situations which are akin to slavery, and it really is an issue. That I means that. Becky Evans is here tonight, from I, I, whom I work with, and she is, you know, heavily interested in researching around modern slavery. But when you look at uh, places like Sports Direct and other places, it is akin to slavery, that modern slavery. There's no two ways about it. Sadly, the difference is, because of legislation pushed through by consecutive governments, uh, strikes aren't that prolific these days. Again, a worsening of times, 
We thought we had it bad in the 80s. This is even worse now. Um, you know, the implementation of ID cards, we have closer whole issue of surveillance, particularly, um, you know, with IT. Uh, migrants, how they are treated, how policed, held in detention centres, etc. This, that's a loose comparison, but you see where I'm trying to go with this. Um, football hooligans were targeted, migrants are targeted, um, my ethnic minorities are targeted and labelled increasingly. That whole notion of Islamophobia, um, whereas in the 80s, and we've said it before, you know, um, where it was the Irish that were under the cosh and under surveillance that, you know, substitute Muslims for that in the present day. For the negative reputation of Liverpool supporters and Liverpool, again, uh, the negative reputation of anyone whose skin colour is something other than white. Um, and so, again, the context, you could say, would be similar. Right after uh, Hillsborough, I uh, wrote a, piece, a little piece in the Huffington Post um, and what I, about where we were at to, with Hillsborough because the prosecutions had just been announced. But what I said was there are many salutary lessons for Grenfell Tower, bereaved families and survivors from the experience of the HJC. Lessons learnt over many years and, and a huge cost to many people. And if I think the HJC and others can do anything to help those around Grenfell, it's to stop them paying the same price as Hillsborough families and survivors had. And it is one of the reasons why, you know, there are people here on the front row that we went down to Grenfell um, early on, met with Pilgrim who introduced us to some residents and survivors. Not because we knew it all, but to show our respect, but also to say we're here and we will help you look out for the pitfalls. You know, no one should suffer what um, Hillsborough families went through. Um, our QC, Pete Weatherby, has written um, quite extensively on it, on um, the Grenfell in relation to Hillsborough. Um, and has said that what, need, what was needed at Hillsborough and certainly what's needed at Grenfell is a swift and transparent wide inquiry with the full involvement of bereaved and survivors. And that was the thing that we said. Stay in control of your own destiny. Do not be controlled by the establishment. And the establishment takes many forms. It's not just the Home Office. It's not just the police. There are a whole range. In the case of Hillsborough, um, a lot of social workers played a role which I was highly critical of and subsequently was highly criticised for. Um, but but I, I, today, all these years later, stand by that. Immediately after um, Hillsborough, and again, I think this is what's happening at Grenfell, is there's a move to close ranks. And at Hillsborough, we know that, ha that happened within an hour, um, where the gymnasium was sealed off, people getting the stories together, etc., etc. And I haven't been around it for that long. I used to find it hard to admit or believe that that was some sort of orchestrated thing. I was going, this is just bad planning, this is just bad planning. But obviously, you know, now with hindsight and with knowledge, I have to concede that the conspiracy did start that early on. And if anything, I would, be, I would go so pro far as to suggest that closing ranks around Grel Grenfell happened even quicker. I really do think it was immediate. Um, and with more disastrous con consequences. When Hillsborough families closed off, um, when, when Hillsborough families and survivors were kept away from the gymnasium, they were kept away, the access to the dead was denied, thereby uh, forcing bereaved, some of the bereaved and some survivors to go many hours searching around Sheffield to look for their relative or their friend who all the time had been lying dead in the gymnasium. And that was unforgivable. And Pilgrim can go into more detail, but as I understand it, um, access to uh, Grenfell families and what happened to them um, was closed off equally swiftly. I know there are issues around uh, the, the very real issues of um, the state of bodies and remains. And 
I think there is a huge issue over numbers, and maybe Pilgrim can say more about that. But from what is being said and from what I have been told, there is a vast difference in the official death toll. Um, and, and I've heard some, and, uh, some pretty horrible stories um, around the lying. But when you think about it, you have to. The enormity of what happened at Grenfell, a few hundred people dead, you're going to try and cover it up unless it's a genuine accident no, and no one's got anything to hide. Um, and that to me goes to the heart of why they can't say how many's dead apart from the very practical issues that we know of. Um, the importance of getting your story straight was cru crucial and we know that from the police you know, statements being altered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think a big difference in, between Grenfell and Hillsborough, and I think this has come out of a learning curve over different things over many years, is um, part and parcel of the cover-up of Hillsborough was some of the emergency services. Uh, for example, the ambulance service was criticized at Hillsborough. Yet, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the firefighters at Grenfell have been highly praised for their response and the criticism has been around the cuts which the, fi which the fire service has had to ensure, uh, suffer which led to uh, issues around uh, poor response or not enough uh, or an inadequate response but the individual uh, firefighters, I think there has been a huge amount of support for them and I am unaware of cover up but then I, I don't know all the ins and outs and equally as well I am um, never surprised by the, how those at the top in any organisation uh, seek to protect their own interests and those of um, the people around them who operate at the same level of them. It's a pure power issue. The need to get your story straight is crucial in it all. If you're going to stage an orchestrated cover-up, we now know that did happen at Hillsborough. Um, what, what many might have thought was ineptitude and the, you know, the few bad apples in relation to the police theory for years. We now know it was an orchestrated cover-up. Um, again, in relation to Grenfell, uh, I don't think it looks good. I don't think it looks good what's happening in relation to... Um, I'll go back on that one for a minute. But in relation to the um, inquiry, uh, I've got a slide down here which kind of shows the... Should I have it? But it's, oh, here it is, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of the, uh, the route following on from a disaster, and certainly this is what happened to Hillsborough, uh, the legal response being a public inquiry inquests and then criminal investigations well of course as you well know uh, the inquests were a joke starting and stopping and mini inquests and then no prosecutions occurred um, the public inquiry held under lord justice taylor um, although it placed the blame at the police store and said the blame of the cause of disaster unequivocally was the fault of the police nevertheless um, no one went on to get prosecuted uh, because the DPP said there was uh, insufficient evidence. Well, we know why there was insufficient evidence, because they were hiding it, you know. But even with the evidence they had, that was sufficient, I believe, to bring about prosecutions. That was part and parcel of the cover-up. We now know that the evidence put before Lord Justice Taylor was limited evidence and that people did not tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth there um, what worries me about uh, i saw the beginning of the grenfell inquiry the other week and um, again the limitations on that because as pete weatherby said and as we said when we went down there keeping people involved is crucial those on the receiving end and yet we see in this inquiry right from the start no no, you cannot play a role in this inquiry. And then you further saw when uh, Mike Mansfield stood up to ask a question that um, he walked out, didn't he? Uh, the judge overseeing it. So it doesn't bode well, does it? And you think of the enormity of Grenfell and um, what you can do to cover all this up. And it really scares me. Um, there's a fundamental difference and the difference, I'll say it now and before I forget is, and it's a difference that I love 
and that is that Grenfell people are shouting very loudly. Um, and I, I was at something yesterday uh, with someone from, from around there and I, I mentioned that because the whole thing around Hillsborough was um, families being policed and policed by their own, but policed by other bereaved families who were bought off by um, because they believed in the establishment and they were bought off by being co-opted with an arm around them or a seat in a director's box at Anfield or wherever. And what they would say would be, um, no, we can't say that. They'll think we don't know how to behave. We have to be dignified. We, dignity is important. Like I've said before, I've got no time for dignity because within that dignity, I've seen the most obscene things being done, the biggest cover-ups, the biggest lies, and the most vulnerable people being exploited. And at one of the meetings, uh, one of the council meetings in London, um, where people kicked off, they were loud, they were shouting, very boisterous. And um, a bereaved uh, widow, a woman I know, um, put on Facebook, she, she lost her husband at Hillsborough and um, she had babies in arms at the time, she had twins. And she said, I've just seen those poor people at Grenfell, I've just seen them at the, that meeting in the council, but it made me so happy that they were shouting and not accepting it. And I wish we'd done that years ago. And I immediately messaged her and went, I agree with you, yet yeah, where did dignity get you? And you saw, because she was part of the mass group, uh, policed, if you like, when she was so vulnerable, she'd lost her husband. She's got young children and is being told to remain dignified. Well, what was dignified about what happened to Hillsborough? What they, how they treated the dead bodies, how they lied and cover up. So those people that argued dignity enabled that cover up as far as I'm concerned over many, many years, whereas they had, they shouted louder and quicker. And they shouldn't have silenced people who were shouting because that's what happened with people getting expelled from support group, et cetera, et cetera. So it really makes me angry that because I love that Grenfell people are shouting and long may they shout because they have seen how long and they have said, we're not waiting 28 years. And it's 28 years and counting for Hillsborough families, don't forget. So I think that's so important. One of the things that um, people have alluded to in relation to how things might move quicker is the proposed Hillsborough law. Now, I held my hands up. I don't fully understand this. And I've got, like, misgivings about it for some reasons, which I'll state. And I think Dave White, similarly, has, we've talked briefly about Hillsborough Law, and I don't, you know, I want someone to convince me about it. I'll just put this quote up from Pete Weatherby, who's one of the people who's drafted it. Hillsborough Law, um, Public Authorities Accountability Bill, which has gone, it's gone into Parliament. It's not, it's, it's not, it hasn't, it's not an act, or any, it's not a law yet. It's, it's a proposal. Um, Hillsborough Law codifies a duty of candour requiring public authorities and public officials and public facing private entities to come clean about their role in disasters. It imposes on them a lawful duty to cooperate with any investigation, not just doing the minimum to comply, but proactively coming clean. Now my argument is, I don't think there should be an, the need for another law. That should be the standard that we operate by. And my fear is that when we bring in some, like people have argued around the Hillsborough Independent Panel becoming uh, like a template for you know, disasters and when things go wrong. It's like another tier. It's like saying we accept the corrupt, uh, that, that society is corrupt, police are corrupt, the establishment is corrupt. We know they are, but we need to be fighting, so that's the minimum standard. But maybe that's naive of me. Um, but I would like to discuss and debate it more with people. Um, and in this instance, you know, anything that pushes the boundaries back, I would, of course, uh, support. Um, I'll go back to that one in a minute. Because what I think is important, what Grenfell people can learn from, from Hillsborough is the need for help. When we went down there, um, 
there was there was talk of you know lawyers getting involved and some really good lawyers offering the services etc my concern wasn't about getting the right lawyers because i didn't think there was that emergency and maybe i'm wrong but what i said was you know lawyers aren't on the on the high street for no reason it's market forces and they're on there for a very good reason so they're still going to be there next month for me the two crucial issues were firstly rehousing people albeit temporary in the first instance and in some comfort um, with with obviously the you know long-term uh, suitable accommodation but for me the most important issue was um, trauma counseling at the highest level immediately because my years of involvement around Hillsborough have seen people suffer uh, to an unnecessary degree precisely because they did not get adequate trauma counselling. I can recall in the early days um, when there was issues around um, PTSD first still being mooted and um, a guy was brought in who had been a doctor in the Falklands and had treated veterans from the Falklands, etc. And he said, um, and literally, and I quoted it somewhere where one of, one of the, uh, I think it was one of the Hillsborough family said, well, I went to see him and um, he said, you've got post-traumatic stress. And he gave me a bottle of tablets and I felt better after that. And it was a panacea, and you would feel better. Someone's put a label on how you're feeling. They give you a tablet that's going to make you feel better in the short term. Well, okay, it's different times. We all know how damaged people become. But we also know that what you need to do is the sooner someone gets help, the better the chances of them recovering and returning to some measure of a quality of life. And we can say that with some experience experience and expertise because we have helped people uh, receive counselling years and years after the event. They might have only told they've been married, subsequently married, had children, never told their wife, never told the kids that they were at Hillsborough, they were only young when they were there. For whatever reason something sparked it and, and horrendous. And that treatment is ongoing by the way. It's not like six quick sessions and you're okay. The damage done over those years is immense and very costly as well. You don't get that on the NHS. Um, and that is a lot of the work that the justice campaign does in supporting people who need that help. Um, we said that when we went down and Becky Shaw and Jill, Jill Whitney on the front row. Um, and we, you know, uh, one is, I don't, you don't mind me saying, do you? No, okay. Uh, one a survivor, one a bereaved um, daughter. And um, what was it? It was very moving to me and it was very profound. But what was that people who had suffered so much wanted to go and say, and just hug someone? I mean, really, at that level. Um, we got some flowers, we, let, we did it really quietly, we didn't want to like, you know, hey, look what we're doing, we just, just went down there. Pilgrim had, had set it up that we could meet a few people, and we kept it very low-key, but I know the response that particularly Becky and um, Jill were met with, it, and the questions, all the questions, it was like, there was that identification, and that was so important. For me, as a, a relative outsider, in this sense. Um, I could see, particularly with a survivor, that I don't think he even recognised how traumatised he was. His little boy was clearly traumatised. That was very moving, very, very upsetting. Um, and we just opened the door there and said, the door's open, it's always going to be there on loads of practical levels, whatever. Um, we, I put on our Facebook page that we'd been there just to let people know because pe we were getting messages saying, what are we doing? We should be doing something, whatever. And I'm going to show you these headlines because it goes to what I said previously about uh, being controlled and my fear that Grenfell people will be controlled. Oh, am I for town? Time? Five minutes? Great, okay. Um, I, um, again, I did this thing in the Huffington Post and um, the headline was, because it was something said, the Hillsborough prosecutions are a victory for our grassroots campaign. Note our grassroots campaign. And um, I said what it was, it was just ordinary people knowing right from wrong, fighting when um, doors wouldn't open 
and we couldn't get round them, we kicked them in. And I've said before, um, so that's a little private joke between Anne Williams and I, and it's linked to Kilburn, but that's a story for when somebody's had a drink as well. But it is literally, yeah. Um, and Anne swore me to secrecy as she used to. But notice um, the collectivity in that. And then um, the Echo got hold of our story from Facebook and rang me. And we didn't particularly want it, but I thought, well, I'm going to bet you're going to have to say something because otherwise they can just lift it, whatever. And actually, the Echo headline was okay because, again, um, they, the last bit was they quoted me. It was a quote from the article, what I'd said. Um, and the headline was, Hillsborough campaigners meet Grenfell families and tell them, believe in people power, believe in yourselves, stay in control of your destiny. That is so important. And that was, you can find that on um, I meant to print them out, but I didn't have time, sorry. Compare this, um, and, and even amongst ourselves, we didn't want to, I mean, Jill actually messaged me and said she wanted to put pictures up of, um, we, we lay some flowers, and it was, it was lovely, you know, it was lovely to see what people had written, etc. And we were so sensitive about it. Firstly, before we even went round to where all the flowers were, we said, would it be okay if we took photographs? Because, you know, is it intrusive? People might be sensitive. And then Jill messaged me and said, do you think it'd be all right if I just put this on Facebook? That sensitivity um, is needed because it's common respect for someone else's experience. So bear in mind those, you know, uh, believe in people power and um, our grassroots campaign. Compare this with a headline the other week. Hillsborough Hero meets Grenfell survivors to give advice on how to get justice. And I don't like singling out individuals, but sometimes you've got to fight back, and that's what the state's done. It's singled out individuals to have us off, have us over an emotional barrel. You can't say that because this person lost someone in Hillsborough. People are bought off and co-opted in many different ways. This article went on um, to state that um, this person had led the campaign for justice. And I, I'm not going to name it because it's obvious who it is, but this person's never been in the justice campaign. In fact, um, <laughs> used to rip stickers at, at something in London where there was a mixture of family support group people and um, HJC people. Survivors and supporters had HJC stickers ripped off them and told this isn't an HJC march, and were reprimanded severely for um, wearing emblems, which had spread the message around it. So this article really upset people, and the reason it upset people was because it upset survivors particularly, because amidst thing, other things said, she actually said how important it was to stay united, and also said how important it was uh, for survivors and families to stay united. And that was just a bit too much for some of us, and certainly for survivors, because that person at one point refused to get on a coach because survivors were on it. Has, um, wouldn't, the, by its very formation, the family support group was not allowed. It didn't have survivors, I accept that. It was supposed to be that just that support group. Uh, members were expelled from the family support group because they wanted to campaign. Um, and that's hence one of the reasons why we have the justice campaign. I'm not saying this to um, single out and scapegoat someone. I'm saying it because those people singled out from the very beginning who co-opted, uh, who were co-opted by establishment figures, they are the very people who tried to destroy the justice campaign over many years. They did not campaign. There were various points over the years where they wanted to close it down. They wanted to close the whole Hillsborough issue down. And I'm not gonna stand here and lie to you because that would be appalling and would do a disservice to the good people still around and the memory of those people who died never living long enough to see justice. And I'm saying it because there's a lesson there for Grenfell. People will be picked off, they will be bought off. It is so important that that is not allowed to happen. The justice campaign is being written out of history. I've said it before, if you read around Hillsborough from, around from the inquest, when they were ongoing, but certainly from the end of the inquest, we are not called for for quotes or anything anymore. There is, I, I could do it graphically, um, and it, it is like, I, I include some lawyers in that, 
I include academics, some noted academics, um, and I include uh, some noted journalists, academics and journalists who you would have a high regard for, who one day I will criti critique in depth with facts and tell the truth about, who have ridden Hillsborough in the same way as other celebrities have, as B-list celebrities have, the brand Hillsborough, the celebrity, when they've written things about the truth and, and have failed to mention the HJC, failed to mention the role played by Anne Williams, John Glover, Dave Church, other fighters, pivotal and good survivors. So the point, you know, I don't mind saying this and people disagree and whatever, and have a go at me, feel free, because I'll, you know, I thrive on that and I'll come back at you and, you know, privately I'll name people to you and if you like them, I'll tell you why I don't like them. Because the frauds who have ridden on Hillsborough in a much more sophisticated way than B-list celebrities. And that will happen at Grenfell if they allow it to. I don't believe they will. There will be people bought off and people co-opted. I know now there's a, there's a myriad of groups um, that's going to happen. But what I would say is, and it's just my final slide to end on, I've shown this slide before. It's, it's just a message, the moral of it all. You never give up. You believe in yourself and it is possible to uh, expose corruption and never blindly accept the words of those in authority. And I'd like to think you wouldn't be bought off or co-opted either. Thank you. Uh, I, I've, 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 there's no other way of putting this, I've fucking dreaded this day actually. I've, I've been in many events with Sheila. Um, I've dreaded the day I have to follow her in a, in a public meeting because uh, it's, not, it's not possible to do that. So please bear with me as I splutter and stutter through the next, uh, through the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, I want to talk, well, well, sorry, first of all I want to say thanks actually for the invite and thanks to Joe, to Kim and to Katie for putting in the shift to make this possible. Thanks to comrades uh, on, the, on, the, on the panel and thanks to you for, for giving up part of your evening. Um, I, I want to say something, I want to put uh, Grenfell in the context of, there's been some discussion about Grenfell as a possible case of corporate manslaughter. I want to situate what happened at Grenfell in relation to corporate manslaughter whilst trying to avoid some of the legal technicalities, not because I don't understand them, but just because they're, they're, they're arcane and not that interesting because the issue isn't about the law really, it's about power, right? Um, I'll then say something about uh, uh, what, what a prosecution under the Act might mean. If we name, if we name Grenfell as a case of corporate manslaughter, uh, which I think it unequivocally is, uh, and then I'll say there are other ways of thinking about Grenfell, many other ways of thinking about Grenfell, two that I want to refer to towards the end of what I've got to say tonight are to think of Grenfell in terms of social harm and to think of Grenfell in terms of social murder. Okay, so... Corporate manslaughter as an offence, or as a charge in, in English and Welsh law, has a, a history of about 50 years, but um, it was a kind of milestone in 2007 when a new law was passed in England and Wales, well, it's actually in Britain, sorry, um, the Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act, it was called something slightly different in, 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 in Scotland, passed in 2007, came into force on the 1st of April in 2008. And the Act was designed ostensibly to make it easier, or indeed to make it possible, because there had never been a conviction before, to make it possible to convict a medium or large size organisation following a death or multiple fatalities for which that organisation, usually a corporation, was responsible. There had been about eight convictions prior to this. They would all been a very small companies, and at the same time as the very small companies, literally kind of an owner-director, have been prosecuted, the individual person, or, or, or in some couple of cases, people who ran the company, uh, uh, the canoeing company or the sandwich shop or whatever, had also been convicted of gross negligence man manslaughter. This allowed companies to be prosecuted and convicted as a company, it was and it was designed to bring in uh, the kinds of companies that have caused multiple fatalities in, in a whole series of training, in, in, uh, train disasters in the 80s and 90s, at uh, the Piper Alpha Oil disaster, the Zeebrugger Ferry disaster, the King's Cross fire, Bradford City, and of course, Hillsborough. So, 
Since the act came into force, nine and a half years, came into force on the 1st of April, there have been 24 convictions and three acquittals. Um, just, that's not very many, so there haven't been loads, there's not been loads of judicial activity around uh, in terms of the new act. Just to put that into some context, there are about 50,000 occupationally related deaths in the UK every year. Year in, year out, every year, 50,000. That's the best estimate, right? The HSE, the body who records occupational fatalities, the official body, the government body, records about 14,000 of them. So since this act's been in place, there have been about 135,000 deaths that may have been subject to a corporate manslaughter prosecution. There have been 24 successful prosecutions, three acquittals. I happen to know, because I've put in a series of FOIs since it's been in place, freedom of information requests since the act's been in place, that the Crown Prosecution Service have looked at several hundred cases, probably four or five hundred cases. So some cases are going through at the CPS, most of them aren't being taken up. Given that the Act was put into place in particular to capture large or medium-sized organisations as opposed to the kind of uh, the family business, the kind of business that was being done under the common law, no large, indeed, probably no, well, OK, certainly no large organisations have been prosecuted under the Act, let alone convicted. No large organisations. Only one probably medium-sized organisation, a company called Cav Aerospace, which is a parent company, actually, of a, of a, of a site where a worker was killed in a warehouse. No medium-sized organisations have been prosecuted under the Act. Uh, Cav, as a medium-sized enterprise, was fined £600,000 for the death of a worker. I'll come, back, I'll, come, I'll, I'll come back to that. But the point is the law clearly isn't working. It's not doing what it was set up to do. There's also a problem with the sanctions attached to the law. Because right? the only, not the only sanction, but the only effective sanction, you can't put a company when it's convicted in prison, right, by definition. So the only sanction that attaches to a successful prosecution under the Act of Conviction is a fine. The sentencing guidelines that came out with the original Act said the minimum fine should be £500,000. In fact, in these 24 cases, in only four cases, has that minimum been met? And one of them was the, the biggest fine so far, £600,000 for CAV Aerospace. Now, Sanctions and fines at that level are a problem. They're a problem in several respects. I'll just refer to two because I'm going to come back to this in relation to Grenfell, right? One of them is £600,000 sounds like a lot of money, and it is. Yeah, in many respects, it is a lot of money, okay? Um, in relation to our lives, it is. In relation to Premier League football, it isn't. But it's a lot of money, okay? What does £600,000 mean to CAV Aerospace? Well, if you look at it, £600,000 in relation to CAV Aerospace's turnover, you look at a percentage, and then you say, OK, what does this mean for the average person who earns the average wage, which in this country at the moment is 27 and a half grand a year? Okay? So as a percentage of CAV's aerospace profits, if I'm earning 27 and a half grand a year, and actually, luckily, I earn more than that, doing very well, thank you very much, right? And I know other people earn a lot less than that. 27 and a half grand... £600,000 equates to £220. That's my fine for killing someone, right? So even the biggest sanction equates to £220 for an ordinary person like us, uh, 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 any of us, which kind of supports the old trade union adage, was if you want to kill someone, don't get a knife or a gun, set up a company and employ them, right? And then kill them, and then you'll get away with it, £220. The other problem with sanctions in relation to the Act is that the company pays the sanctions, but the company pays a fine, but who really pays for that fine? Well, we may pay for that fine as customers because prices go up. Workers may pay because they may not get price, price, uh, pay rises. And if it's a public body, all of us will pay as council taxpayers, right? And obviously I'm going to come back to that in relation to Grenfell. Uh, I wanted to kind of take a slight detour and just refer to a, a, another high-rise fire that you'll know of, probably know of, in Lackanell House in, in the London Borough of Southwark in 2009. The fire in Lackanell House uh, killed six residents. Uh, there was a, a, a long consideration of a, of a prosecution for corporate manslaughter and, uh, and the CPS decided not to prosecute Southwark Council uh, in that context. It said that there was insufficient evidence to pass a legal test under the Act, despite the fact that the Council, quote, knew the building posed a fire risk, but did not act and had not carried out a fire risk assessment. Southwark was eventually fined £570,000 under fire safety and health and safety uh, legislation. The last thing I want to say about how the Act has worked in practice is that previously, under the old law, 
For a company to be convicted, a small company, the owner and director was also convicted. A, a com the conviction of a small company was always accompanied by the conviction of an individual. What we're finding now is that in these cases, these 24 convictions, generally what's happening is that the directors of companies are offering up guilty pleas or offering up the evidence to convict the company in exchange for their personal immunity. So they're no longer being convicted, they're no longer being sent to prison. So a law which looked progressive is actually regressive in the sense that while well, corporations can, can, in theory, but aren't being right, 24 in nine years can be convicted, this new law is protecting individuals. I was going to say something about the prosecution to Hillsborough, but, 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 uh, but actually Sheila's covered that and, uh, and, and, uh, and obviously the case is kind of ongoing. Okay. Now the... the, the the Metropolitan Police, and we always believe everything they say, of course. The Metropolitan Police have already said that they're actively considering uh, uh, preparing charges for the CPS of, of corporate manslaughter against, uh, against the council, Kensington and Chelsea, and against the Tenants Management Organisation. But in fact, you know, even if you kind of know the basics of the corporate manslaughter law, and you know the basics about what appears to have happened at Grenfell, this seems to be, there seems to be a prima facie case for a corporate manslaughter, a corporate manslaughter charge in relation to Grenfell. And if there was, it would be the first case launched against a large organisation, because the council would be by far the largest organisation which had ever been brought within the ambit of the new law. So it would be potentially very significant. So what the law requires is that, uh, is that, the, is that the, the offending institution is a corporate body. What is a corporate body? Every private company, but also local authorities, trusts, and other government bodies. So certainly for the council and probably for the tenants management organisation, the TMO, tick that first criterion. The law also requires that that corporate body, the responsible organisation, must have owed a duty of care to the person or persons who died. And the duty of care is set out in various ways. But included with that, in that duty of care, the particular kind of duty of care that has to be owed are, quote, uh, sorry, this includes, quote, local councils in the provision of particular services towards those receiving their services, residents, and also organisations involved in the construction or maintenance operations towards those affected by their activities. So refurbishment at Grenfell tick. So the second criterion clearly applies to some of the organisations on the scene at Grenfell prior to the fire. Uh, the third criterion is about the, is about the standard, of the, st the way in which that duty of care is discharged. There must have been a failure in the way the organisation was managed or organised, which amounts to a gross breach of the duty of care, which then, of course, led to the deaths. Uh, a gross breach is defined as, quote, something which falls far below what can reasonably be expected. And all of the evidence that we have emerging from the conditions prior to the fire at Grenfell indicates pretty clearly that there's at least a case to answer on that third criterion. And finally, a substantial element of that gross breach, that failure, must be at senior management level. In other words, they must be failures defined uh, uh, de uh, by, p quote, persons who play significant roles in the making of decisions about activities uh, or the actual managing or organisation of the whole or substantial part of those activities. It's all very boring stuff, but what it means is that the, the council and the tenants management organisation should be in the dock. Whether they are or not, and when they are or not, because it could be years away, right? But it's unequivocally a case to answer against those two organisations based upon the evidence that we have in front of us, right? And it was collated by the Grenfell Action Group for years prior to the fire. There are also possible cases against other organisations. Ryden, the lead contractor in the refurbishment of the tower prior to the fire, is the main private sector organisation in the frame. Ryden managed eight main subcontractors who carried out refurbishment in the tower, and there were about 50 other private subcontractors involved in, in, in construction and maintenance activities in the tower prior to the fire. So there's a lot of fucking private companies that could, could end up in the dock, all right? Many of them, of course, are very small. If there was a corporate manslaughter prosecution, think about justice, truth and accountability, would that represent justice? If there was a conviction of one or some of these organisations following the fire, would that represent justice? Well, no, it wouldn't, in the sense that, for what, in one sense, the, the, the ability to prosecute corporations, with these companies, these organisations, would probably be won at the expense of letting individuals off the hook, that exchange of liability, immunity for key individuals to let the company take the rap, the organisation take the rap. So that would let, likely let individuals off the hook and that wouldn't represent justice. It wouldn't represent justice either because any fine that was levied, not, notably upon the council, 
would actually be dispersed to the innocent. It would be paid ultimately by the council taxpayers of Kenton and Chelsea. They would end up paying, right? The council doesn't really have its own money. It's got reserves, but they would end up paying. Would it represent justice in another sense? In the sense of, uh, would, would, would a successful prosecution really, really recognise the multitude of harms caused by the way in which that tower block was run and by the fire in its aftermath? And I'll say no, and I'll come to some of those in a moment. There is one sense in which a successful prosecution under this Act would represent justice, and that's in the symbolic sense. It would send a message that you can't simply kill 80 or hundreds of people and get away with it and enjoy legal impunity. It would send a symbolic message, and it would also do something else. It would do something else which certainly bereaved families I've worked with want, right, in relation to an occupational fatality, being bereaved by a death at work. They want a legal and an official acknowledgement that a crime has been caused and that the bereaved person, their loved one, has been killed through criminality. They want that, right? They want an acknowledgement, they want a recognition of a crime. And the symbolic message of a successful prosecution for culprit manslaughter would send that. So if Grenfell is a case of corporate manslaughter, which I think it clearly is, whatever happens legally, right? Because that's not about the law, as I said, that's about power, right? Grenfell is about social harm. It's one of the, and I've been kind of trying to document some of this stuff in terms of the impacts that the fire has, has had, will continue to have, and indeed will continue to have for, for, for many, many years. And I think there are different dimensions to these forms of social harm, and I just want to give you an indication of each of them. I'm not going to talk for ages about them. But I think that there are also kind of ripples of harm. And by, by ripples of harm, I mean that these harms will affect the people who are in the tower on the, on the night, right? They will affect the people who got out. But they'll affect the people who live in the local area. But they will also ripple out and they'll affect the people in the borough. And actually, these, many of these harms will affect the high-rise dwellers across the country, particularly in relatively deprived areas, who may live in fear and terror of a similar incident occurring in their equally unsafe high-rise accommodation, dwelling, home. So one set of kind, one sort of series of dimensions, I'll just give an indication of what I mean by each rather than go on uh, for ages through this. One set of kind of harms produced by, uh, by, the, uh, by, by the, the fire, this aftermath, are a whole series of emotional and psychological harms. Sheila's already referred to some of these in the aftermath of Hills, but they're very obvious. I don't need to talk about them. They're captured by words like grief and loss. They're captured by words like fear and terror. They're captured by words like guilt and self-loathing amongst those who survived. But I also think amongst all of the kind of obvious, but obvious harms produced, which will endure for many, many years, not least given the shit state of mental health services in this country, right? Aside from all of those kind of obvious harms, are the harms produced by what caused the fire in many ways, and the harms produced by the state and the establishment's response to the fire. And Sheila touched on this in relation to Hillsborough. That emotional and psychological harms have been treated with contempt. We've been, we've been treated, not listened to, being treated as if your life is worth less than others, being treated as if you are fucking worthless. And after the fire, being lied to, being told you'll be permanently accommodated within a month. No. Contempt, I think, is the most kind of, it's the source of the most searing emotional and psychological trauma associated with Grenfell. There are cultural and relational harms. I'll just give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. I mean the kind of, the, the harms associated with the loss of treasures, of treasure possessions, things that can't be replaced, which were lost in the, in the flats. There are cultural and relational harms associated with the break of our networks by being rehoused away from the local community, away from the area, away from people's social networks. There are the relational and cultural harms being associated by taking kids out of school for short periods of time. Indeed, kids who were just about to face, in many, in many respects, exams. So a whole series of harms that, to, that need documenting, I think, there. There are financial and economic harms. Financial harms for the families of various kinds um, who, have been, uh, who have been displaced from their home. But also economic harms in the sense that, that the kind of, you know, the coming to light, that these kinds of conditions weren't unique to Grenfell, but are reproduced in working class communities across the country. They will have economic consequences for all local authorities and therefore for all of us. We will all pay for the crimes committed at Grenfell in trying to make tower, high rise tower blocks safer so that Grenfell isn't repeated. And of course there are a whole series of physical harms. There are the deaths, the 80 or the hundreds of deaths, obviously. 
They're exposed to toxins about which we know nothing. Very, 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 very little is said. But the shit that was spewing around that community for days, the shit that remains in the ashes around that building, local people are exposed to that. They're ingested that on a daily basis. There are the physical harms associated with people with particular health effects. People are housed in, uh, people are housed in temporary accommodation like hotels and guest houses who have diabetes. But in a hotel or a guest house, they can't make their own food. They don't control their own diet. Therefore, basic conditions like diabetes associated, of course, with higher levels of deprivation, are being made worse by the temporary accommodation in which these people are being, in which many people are being kept. So there are a whole series of harms, some of which are obvious, some of which are kind of much less obvious, which I think we need to recognise and document uh, as consequences of what happened in Grenfell that night. So just to finish off, we can see Grenfell as corporate manslaughter, and we can see Grenfell as social harm, and I think, finally, we need to see Grenfell as social murder. Uh, now, I've been doing some work for the past few years around social protection, by which I mean very boring things called regulation and enforcement. Regulation of health and safety laws, food protection laws, pollution control laws, fire safety laws, right, all that boring shit that no one cares about until the shit hits the fan. And where you don't have social protection, where the state pulls social protection away, then the state is uh, colluding in or producing social murder. And social murder, when I started to use that phrase, I nicked it from a, an old guy called Friedrich Engels, uh, Karl Marx's mate, who wrote with Karl Marx and, and financially supported Karl Marx. And, and it comes from, a, comes from a book, in particular, that Engels wrote in 1845, this is a republication, 1969, a book on the condition of the working class in England. So Engels is nosing around Manchester at the time, and he's describing the conditions of the working class. And he uses this term, social murder, and I think it tells us a lot about uh, 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 the mass killings by corporations and states, which are exemplified in the Grenfell Tower, in the fire at Grenfell Tower. So he says, when one individual inflicts bodily injury upon another, such injury that death results, we call that deed manslaughter, when the assailant knew in advance that the injury will be fatal, we call this deed murder. So he's saying in that first bit of quotation, look, you know, when, when interpersonal violence results in a, in a death, whether it's, if it's intentional or, or recklessness, we recognise that as murder, right? That's what the criminal law does, that's what the police are concerned about, and, and, and so on and so on. Have you. That's conventional crime. But, he says, but when society places hundreds of proletarians in such a position that they inevitably, inevitably, inevitably meet a too early and unnatural death, when it deprives thousands of the necessaries of life, places them under conditions in which they cannot live, forces them to remain in such conditions, like an unsafe tower block, until that death ensues, which is the inevitable consequence, knows that these thousands of victims must perish, and yet permits these conditions to remain. Its deed is murder, just as, sure, just as surely as the deed of the single individual. So, he says, with perfect correctness, we should characterise these deaths as social murder, and I think we should characterise the deaths of Grenfell Tower as social murder. Thank you very much. Yeah? No, no, I don't, I don't have... Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on the same uh, subject matter in, in a way. What Steve's done, I think, and, and following um, what, what Sheila did, is put this in the discussion that the centre that's hosting us, and thanks very much to the CCSE, by the way, for hosting us and to everyone who's organised this, but this is a centre that studies a critical analysis of the law and a critical analysis of the, of the concept of, of crime. And in terms of what Steve's saying, it doesn't look very critical, actually. It's just very descriptive and very, very clear um, in terms of, 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 of what we're talking about. We, but we still have to point out the kind of contradictions and use a language which people are un uncomfortable with. And I agree with Steve, probably the only value of a, of a corporate manslaughter uh, prosecution here will be symbolic and will be the fact that that language partly has, has entered our, our lexicon and the way that Engels tried to bring that language into our lexicon. I'm going to talk about a different set of offences which kind of follows directly from what Steve was saying. Um, which uses also a language we might not be familiar with, joint enterprise. Now, some of you will be aware that, that joint, joint enterprise is the legal concept, common law concept, that's been used mainly to prosecute and convict young black men who are associated with being gang members for putting something on Facebook or phoning up their mate 
or even texting a, 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 a message. It's, there's, a, there's an important campaign group called Jengba, which is fighting against joint, joint enterprise and the way it's used. Actually, it's a, it's a criminal law concept and a language that we can apply directly uh, to, 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 to this case to talk about all of the, the, the subcontractors that, 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 that Steve um, indicated. And that language is important because think about the phrase joint enterprise. When I was talking to a mate of mine about this who'd never heard of that phrase before, they said, yeah, yeah, joint enterprise. Is that the law for corporations? For cor <coughs> joint enterprise, business, is the language here that we're talking about. And that's partly because joint enterprise is seen as something where different groups of people come together to produce one outcome. And that's precisely why this concept, uh, or the starting point for understanding why this concept works. By the way, the last time I was here with Steve, um, Brian Ashton and David Jakes, we were doing a talk on, on, um, on, a, on the Sonai plant up in, in and the, the impact of the community of that factory in, in, in Kirby. And we got, a, a, I don't know if Joe remembers this, but we got a, a we got a, a kind of strategic legal threat from the managing director of the company uh, telling us that we shouldn't use the words capitalism kills in conjunction with that uh, particular company. Well, actually, when I, I, I wrote a piece on Grenfell as joint enterprise that The Guardian was interested in, the open democracy were interested in, is sufficiently interested to pass to their lawyers, and the lawyer said, no, we can't use that language when we're applying it to uh, what happened at Grenfell Tower. I mean, come on. We can't even talk, use a, a language of criminalisation in the context of, 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 of the, the horrors of Grenfell Tower. And I'm going to explain why we can, we can talk about that. And actually, I'm going to do what me and Steve did the last time. I'm going to name the company. I'm going to uh, name names anyway. I will say there's a proviso here. There's a proviso because I'm going to talk about the way in which the cladding was purchased, supplied and fitted. And I'm not saying that was the cause, and I think that's a very important job to be done by the inquiry. I've, I've got similar misgivings about particularly the scope of the, the inquiry. But I will say this, it was the primary focus of the Metropolitan Police's investigation. And it was the primary uh, focus of the initial British government, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the initial investigations into testing the safety of materials. So it is the most, at the moment, I think it's the, it's the, it's the, the, the one aspect of what's happened that's attracted probably rightly the most, uh, the most uh, uh, inquiry. And that, for me, is a joint enterprise. It's a joint enterprise because, and this relates directly to, to what Steve was talking about, in that Corporate Manslaughter Act, which is pathetic and not fit for purpose, the 2007 Corporate Manslaughter and Homicide Act, it explicitly says, an individual cannot be guilty of aiding, abetting, counselling or procuring the commission of an offence of corporate manslaughter. If you look at the common law of joint enterprise, it's exactly the same words. You can, and I, there was an appeal court ruling last year that said, you can, you can convict someone of murder or manslaughter for aiding, abetting, counselling or procuring the commission uh, of, of, of the offence. The test is whether the secondary offender uh, could have foreseen that their participation in the cases I was talking about, even posting a picture on Facebook, actually, uh, might lead to the primary offender committing a lawful act. The primary offender here could easily be uh, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. It could easily be the, the, the TMO. The, the, the two focuses of the, of the corporate manslaughter investigation. And the question then is, okay, who was committing that secondary offence? Who was doing something that could have foreseen their participation contributed to the main offence? And, and, and the primary offender may well be Ryden that, 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 that Steve mentioned. I'm going to quickly go through um, a number of stages here. First of all, the company that supplied the cladding, Arconic, its response was, and, and, and there's evidence from that company, they knew what the purpose of the cladding they supplied was. They have brochures that they've published showing that the cladding that was used should not be used in buildings above 10 metres. And when that was pointed out to them in the press, they said it was not our role to decide what was or was not compliant with local building regulations. So that's a, a denial, but clear uh, knowledge of, of what they were doing. Omnist Exteriors, who cut the, the cladding to be fit, um, they said they played no part in the selection of that material, but similarly there's evidence that they 
knew exactly what it was going to be used for and that that was a breach of the not only the law but the, the, the documents they had in front of them which told them what, whether that, that, what that material should be used for. The company fitting the cladding, Harley Facades, which by the way is currently undergoing a fraud investigation um, and it's a, it's a, you know, that would be another 20 minute discussion to go through all of those companies involved and show how they're, they've been involved previously in some form of criminality or an ongoing criminality. Thanks, Steve. Um, Halley Facades, when it was confronted with the awkward fact that it had been responsible for fitting the cladding, it responded, the cladding used in the development was as billed in the contract. You can see what's happening here. We've got layers of denial, but clear knowledge, and I would go back to that point, a clear foreseeability that what they did could participate in what eventually uh, happened. Artelia, the cost management contractor who actually suggested changing the cladding to save money, uh, said it was not their role to look at the design of the project or specification and or approval of materials. We've gone, that's four, four layers. We've gone to the fifth layer is Rarden, of course. Um, and none of these, even if these denials are accurate, which, which is highly questionable because of the evidence we have, it does not exonerate any of them. And it certainly does not exonerate Ryden, who, who have the, the primary responsibility, the legal responsibility in all of this. And what about the TMO, the Tenant Management Organisation? And it's not exactly, we didn't even have to rely on the Canary or the underground left press or anything like that or, or social media. The Times did the exposure of the meeting in which, and the, and the email which was sent on the 16th of July, which said, we need good cost savings for Councillor Fielding Mellon and the planner tomorrow at 8.45 a.m. And as a result of that, well, more than £200,000 worth of cost savings were, were, were found, and that included the downgrading of the materials that, that I've discussed. So there's a clear paper trail of joint enterprise. That's not for me to say. I'm not a police officer. I'm not a lawyer, right? But obviously I analyse the law and I understand these legal concepts. Of course no police officer has pursued this as a joint enterprise case. Because joint enterprise is reserved for working class people who are accused of being in gangs, mainly black people. If you talk to Jengba, 80% of people who are prosecuted under joint enterprise are young black men. They're not the kind of people that were the legitimate businesses and enterprises um, that we're talking about. But there's very clear evidence, I think, that those participants that I've talked about could clearly have foreseen their that their actions could lead to, uh, the, to, to, to lead to what happened. So what's the message that, that, that we have here? Well, the law, I mean, it's almost the point that Steve was making in a different context. The law is enough. But the, law, the, the, the legal system can't even conceptualise, can't even bring itself to think about how this, how this might be applied. The same law, exactly the same law, enables the courts uh, to convict young black men uh, on one hand and on the other, thinking about this, the same wording that's excluded from corporate manslaughter, with the other hand, to exonerate and gift impunity uh, to the individuals. Uh, and, and corporate executives and council chiefs for, for doing exactly the same thing. But, uh, you know, like Steve and like many people in this room, I'm not, uh, I don't have any kind of faith anyway in the law being able to de deliver the outcomes, particularly the outcomes of justice that, 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 that we need. Um, and, and we know that's because the law, and we've heard it in very specific terms, and you sound like you're being very kind of rudimentary and, and kind of kind of almost the sort of taking the sort of simplistic analysis you'd pull students up for when you say that the law simply upholds a system of class domination. Now that's not to say in every case the law rules in favour of the rich and every law is designed uh, for the rich. But clearly there's something in the law that does uphold, and I'm going to be very specific here. Property relationships, that's what we're talking about. That's what, exactly what we're talking about when it comes to Grenfell Tower and when it comes actually for the ability of corporations, forms of property to be, uh, to, to be uh, prosecuted in a court but the 
owners of that property and the directors of that organisation not to be held accountable uh, in, a, in a court. And that's what we see right the way through the biggest picture here, the bigger story here. The whole story about the bonfire of red tape that's been going on in this country for 30 years. By the way, if we're talking about the fire regulations which effectively privatised the function of local fire inspection, we have to point the finger at the Labour Party, not just the, the Conservative parties have been involved in, in, this, in this bonfire uh, of red tape. Most recently, I mean, it's, in, it's astounding, uh, the, the two examples where the Labour Party uh, uh, in 2016 and I think 2014 tried to introduce legislation which didn't give much, just gave tenants the rights to prosecute landlords for substandard housing. And it was continually pushed away and pushed away. And I'll use the words because it's typical of this whole, this whole period where, uh, where, where red tape, where regulations that protect us are, are, are undermined and devalued and seem to be a burden on, on business. This would be unnecessary regulation. Uh, on landlords, said the, the housing minister then, Brandon, Brandon Lewis. Steve said something about the, the workplace uh, already. We've probably got about a fifth of the number of workplace inspections in this country that we ha than we had 30 years ago. On average, you can expect in your workplace to be inspected once every 50 years. And that's a direct result of uh, precisely the bonfire of red tape. We've heard about the fire services. Actually, I'm going to specifically refer to a, a National Audit Office report here on fire services um, that Steve and I used in a, in a short piece that we, that, we, that we wrote about that. Between 2010 and 2015, um, the funding for, for, for sta I mean, you know what's coming, it's a period of austerity, but the, period, the, the funding for standalone fire services fell by 28% on, on average. Fire safety checks fell by, in tower blocks by 25% in the same uh, five years. But that same report very chillingly said these, the, the reduced funding um, applied most to the fire authorities, fire and rescue authorities with the highest level of need as defined by social and demographic, uh, uh, demographic factors. In other words, the poorest areas lost out. In, in those cuts, as, and that's happened, as we know, across the board in terms of austerity. I think that we have to understand that bonfire of red tape as part of the way the law acts primarily to support property relations that we have at the moment, i.e. to support a corporate economy in which corporations were to constantly told that we can't pass regulations which, uh, which, which interfere with corporate activities, with profit making, with economic growth, which now, by the way, thanks to this government, uh, economic growth is, a, is a, a legal obligation on every inspector in every regulatory authority before they take any action, any legal action, they have to consider uh, regulatory growth. Uh, sorry, economic growth before they take those, those, those decisions. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the austerity context, but a couple of really important aspects of that bonfire of regulation in the context of Grenfell Tower. I don't know how many people know this, but the, the uh, Audit Commission was, was, uh, was closed down by this government. Now, what that means is, effectively, the government, and I'm not saying they were perfect, but the government auditor that used to audit local authorities and other public bodies doesn't exist anymore. What does that mean in the context of Grenfell Towers? It means that the Royal Borough of Kingston uh, and Chelsea are now audited by KPMG. It also means KPMG are the current primary auditors of Riding Group, the primary contractor in last year's renovations that's been most under the, the spotlight. Not only that, KPMG entire, uh, uh, audit a number of entire PFI consortiums doing these regeneration projects around London and around the country, including the Chalcotts housing estate, which has been under the spotlight so much since Grenfell Tower, which has also been done by, by Ryden. So you have a, a, a structure of corruption. We can't, we can't stop short of using that word when we have a, a, a public function, and I'm using, I'm using the phrase that David Beetham uses, where the public interest is distorted and subverted for private interest. That's David Beetham's definition of corruption. That's what's going on in that KPMG 
uh, economy. Um, finally, I wanted to say some things about the way in which gentrification kind of led uh, reg forms of regulation were important here, and I don't, I don't have time to go, go into it because I want to get back finally to the context of austerity. But two issues. The two major campaigns in 2015 and 2016 that the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Council led were camp the, the, the two main building regulation campaigns. The first one was, was a series of prosecutions where they prosecuted companies for the way in which the buildings looked on the side if they were hanging unsightly banners or, or un, unsightly uh, coverings. Now that tells us a lot because we know that one of the reasons the cladding was being put up in the first place was part of the gentrification project to make the building look aesthetic to the residents in the, in the, in the wealthier parts who didn't want to look at that, that building. So there's an aesthetic form of regulation going on. No one's being prosecuted for breaching building regulations. They're being prosecuted for the way the building looks. The second uh, campaign they led was on noise reduction. Companies being, and I'm not saying these things are not important, these things are important, but they're being prioritised above fire safety and other safety aspects because this is regulation which is gentrification led in, in that borough and many boroughs around, um, around, around London. Steve said some things about the way in which a corporate manslaughter prosecution will lead to the, 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 the poorest people, actually, of that borough ultimately footing the bill for any fine that comes down the line. We know that actually everything I've said about the lack of scrutiny, the lack of regulation in that borough was unnecessary. We know it's possibly the richest borough in the country. We know it had enough money, even in this period of austerity, to be funding regulation. I'm going to give you some figures from, uh, from the, the, actually from the submission to the inquiry that I put in with a group called Research for Action, where we scrutinised exactly how the borough had been funded over the, over the last uh, few years. This is a borough that didn't have to go down the austerity road. It was rich enough. It was rich enough not to make those cu cutbacks on the building itself or on the form of regulation. OK, between 2010 and 2017, the council itself voted to slash council tax income by 21% in, in that borough. And at the same time, what they did was they gave an efficiency dividend. They treated the, they treated the borough like it was a private company. They gave an efficiency dividend, which went to, mainly went to the residents who were paying the highest council tax, the, the super wealthy that live, live in the borough. So council tax was reduced, slashed, year on year, as an efficiency dividend because the borough has so much in terms of its reserves and its revenue. Uh, anyway... And if you compare that to the rest of, of the comparable 33 London boroughs, as it's slashing by 21%, they're increasing by 6.5%, even in, in, in this period. What does that mean? What does that mean to the residents, and particularly the poor residents uh, of, of that borough? It means £167 million pounds in spending lost in, in uh, the eight-year period that I'm talking about. A reduction of 81% spent on planning, a reduction of 76% spent on housing, and a, and a reduction of 22% spent on regulatory control. In that borough, they didn't have to do it. They were imposing austerity. That Tory council were imposing austerity on the residents of, of Grenfell Tower and all the other uh, estates uh, in, in that borough. I'm going I'm to just quote, have I, got, have I got, how long have I got? Okay, I'm going to quote Joe Benjamin, who actually who is the financial researcher who's responsible for digging out a lot of that data. Um, with RBKC, so the Border Council, and CKCTMO, the, the Tenancy Management Organisation, now facing criminal investigation over the Grenfell Tower fire, councillors and management will have the additional challenge of explaining why 144 million to 167 million plus was needlessly bled from their own budgets while skimping and saving on critical safety measures elsewhere, which would have cost less than a twelfth, uh, sorry, a twentieth, what the council voted to cut from the council tax income in a single calendar year. I would say that is evidence that they should be put in the dock for a joint enterprise prosecution as well. This is the violence of austerity. It's institutional violence that's done by people who hide behind a uh, corporate brand name and they, and they hide behind... 
the name of a council and actually, the, 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 in this case, the name of a political party, the Conservative Party. And I think any serious criminal investigation could be asking questions that would put them directly in the focus, uh, not just of, of our anger, but also of the criminal justice system. And I'll leave it there. Okay, well, I don't quite know how I'm going to follow all of those guys. Um, and I would ask that you bear with me. I'm still working. It's been less than four months um, since the fire. And I'm still working with um, residents. Um, and it's quite hard sometimes to pull yourself out of the very difficult day-to-day -day work that changes a lot from day-to-day -day, um, and, and go take a step back and look at the bigger picture and sort of get an analytical point of view. I mean, I've already learned quite a lot from the stuff that you guys have been talking about. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about, I'll give, basically give you an overview of what I've seen happen between 2015 and where we are now, but I'll refer in some ways to the themes that these guys have, have brought to the fore. Um, like Joe said, I'm a housing campaigner, um, and I want you to remember that the background to this um, is essentially the property market, um, neoliberal changes to our financial system, um, and the bigger economic framework um, that, that shapes how we're living now um, and, and what happened at Grenfell and is ultimately the cause of what happened at Grenfell. Um, I am a member, I've worked with Sheila for many years. Um, I helped to set up, I've been a housing campaigner in London for quite a long time as well, and that movement and the response against and the reaction to what's happening around housing, you know, in terms of um, changes to welfare, in terms of changes to um, public housing, um, tenancies, um, legislation that's been brought in over the past seven years, um, yeah, particularly over the past seven years, um, has created um, a, an increase and a, 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 a rise of small um, campaigning groups across the capital, um, whether that's around private renting, whether that's around um, regeneration, um, resistance to evictions, and so on. And it was in that group that I met um, Ed, Eddie Daffan, who was the person who's, who you may um, hopefully have seen him on TV. He was the main person who was at the forefront of the Grenfell Action Group. Um, he was already involved in campaigning against regeneration um, across London. And that was what he was fighting back in 2015, the bigger regeneration of that part of North Kensington. Um, he then asked if I could help, I'm a community organiser, um, he asked if I could come and help organise his tower block um, as this refurbishment was going on. Um, and it wasn't the cladding that they were concerned about, it was the internal works that were being done. Um, there's about, there were about, 100 and, yeah, about 120 flats in the building. Um, so I went and I, I spoke to him about it. I spoke to one or two other people about it and it seemed viable. Um, and there's something actually I might go back to later if I've got time and if I remember that's quite interesting um, and relevant to that. But um, the first meeting... I attended, there were 100 residents at, and uh, any of you who do community organising um, will know that you go to a campaign and there's 100 people affected, there's a, a group of people affected by, by an issue, and you've got 125 flats, and 100 people have come to that first meeting. It's very obvious they feel very, very strongly about that. They've come there in their own personal time, after work, They've got babysitters and so on. They'd much prefer, often, we met when the football matches were going on. Eventually, we moved it around that, so we didn't ask that of people. Um, the um, refurbishment was going on in the flat. The, you know, it's, um, the 
the council had shown these guys a show flat that was to install new boilers. Um, and the work that was being done in the flats um, when Ryden contractors came in and started undertaking this work was absolutely nothing like what had been shown to residents in the show flat. Um, pipes were sticking out of, wall, of walls. I don't know if any of you live in social housing. I mean, quite often you'll know that you could get quite often some sub-quality work perhaps in your flat. But what was obvious here was that poor quality of work was just being done as standard deliberately throughout all of the flats. Um, so as residents saw some people's flats being having the, the um, new boilers going in, they of course became quite angry. The boilers were meant to have been in a normal place above the sinks in the kitchen. When the workmen came in to do it, they were putting the boilers in the entrance hallways, quite narrow hallways that you've got in blocks of flats. Um, so the residents were pretty pissed off about it. And we decided that, well, you know, it was obviously winnable. Um, these people could, if they could take collective action and if they were willing to struggle and make a fuss, it was totally possible that um, this work could be reversed. Now, at the time, we, they weren't bothered about the cladding. The cladding was going up. It had no you know, immediate impact on them at all. Um, had they been consulted on that properly, then obviously this wouldn't have happened, the fire. Um, so we fought, they fought brilliantly, um, really hard. Um, you know, all sorts of people, like Sheila said, you know, it's actually a very, very strong community there. Um, it's a real variety of people. Yeah, they're low income, a lot of them, but not all of them at all. Some of them owned their own flats. You know, some of them were private renters. A large proportion of them were immigrants, or refugees, and so on. But um, a strong community. These people knew each other, at least on their own landings. They shared public space around the building. Um, and it was a real, real pleasure working with them, actually. Um, and we just fought and we started, you know, at the beginning doing ordinary things like you would do. You'd, you'd write and ask to see if the councillor would speak to you about it. Um, you'd write and ask to see if somebody from the TMO would speak to you about what was going on. And we just got no response. I then wrote on behalf of the organisation I was working for, still um, senior councillors and um, senior managers at the TMO just didn't respond to me at all. And that is surprising. I mean, I've dealt with councils a fair bit, and I know they're not very good um, necessarily at, you know, in terms of managing buildings, but what they would usually always do is respond when a big trade union comes and says, we're about to do a campaign against you with your residents, will you meet with us? They will meet with you. But these guys, they just ignored us. Um, so we sort of stepped up bit by bit, petitions, um, protests outside the um, TMO offices, um, the residents put signs up in front of their doors and refused access to the contractors. Now, that cost them money. Um, and it was after that that they said that they might start talking to us. Uh, it was actually also at that time that they threatened residents with their tenancies and wrote to them and said, you're breaking your tenancies. If you don't give us access, we'll take legal action against you. So these residents had to be really strong and resilient to, to, you know, to, to be able to resist that. Um, and some of them dropped out at the time and you know we'll see what happens in the inquiry and what contribution those boilers and that pipework may have had on the fire itself or of people's ability to escape um, but certainly if they did contribute to the fire or and lives are surviving or being lost then it would certainly be a fact that the very most vulnerable um, in that building were because of discrimination, um, they lost their lives. Um, so there had been historical negligence and a lack of care for these people, this working class section of that community. But more so than that, these people stood as an actual obstacle to profit. That building had been allowed to deteriorate for a long, long time. 
it's not uncommon for that to happen in London that, um, on, on council estates, that there's managed decline of council estates. Um, those estates can then be um, knocked down, part privatised, um, and profit can be made from them. So that's the context. There was a lot of money that was potential, potentially about to be made in that, in that area. Um, and actually that building itself had had plans for it to be demolished that the residents had fought against. Um, that was in 2015. They won the thing about the boilers and that was that, you know, as far as I was concerned. Um, they, they had been, the other, the other ask that they'd wanted was that they had been allowed to form a residence association. Um, and, alt and meet and um, that be that their residence group be a formal voice on behalf, a collective voice on behalf of those residents. Um, and so the campaign came to an end. They had won on the boilers. The boilers weren't going to be installed. The next stage for them was to get the boilers taken out from those who hadn't managed to resist um, Ryden contractors and the council. Um, and they were then allowed to form a residence association. So then, you know, I'd forgotten about it. I remembered some of them individually. You know, I met, and I, I know, and I'd met some brilliant people while I was working there. Um, excuse me. And so that morning, I went on Twitter, and I just saw another disaster. Um, and then it dawned on me that these were people that I knew. And throughout the day, it started coming back to me how poorly they had been treated. Um, and they have continued to be treated like absolute rubbish. Um, there was no state support. It looked like a third world country um, in those days following the fire. I mean, literally looked like a third world country, people on the streets, no sign of any officials at all. There was no state presence except for the police. Um, you know, clothes on the street, food on the street, bottles of water on the street, people self-organising. Um, and that support still isn't there. Every single bit of support that's been given, residents have had to fight for. So at the time when they should be grieving um, and trying to put their lives back together, they are fighting for the very most basic things um, which shouldn't be happening. Um, they have been treated with contempt. Um, the harms that they have been inflicted upon them and not just them, upon that wider community, is kind of unfathomable, really. Um, and some of the stuff Sheila said around people being controlled, a deliberate cover-up, what people would think would be sort of conspiracy theory type stuff. I mean, I've been shocked at some of the stuff that I've seen. Um, there were deliberate attempts to set up fake residence groups, um, and it just went on in front of our eyes. I think the, the state underestimated how connected, certainly underestimated how intelligent that community is, but they also um, underestimated and just didn't understand, I think, what that community was and how interlinked and how many relationships existed within that. Um, we saw visibly in front of our eyes just like an unbelievable attempt by somebody, we don't know who, to set up a fake family and bereaved group. Um, an ex, a former pol um, police commander was named on the agenda for that group. Um, we've been subject to constant attacks in the media. Um, that, that again takes a lot, a lot of work to, we stopped the last one, but it was two days worth of work to stop the last media story that would have done so much damage to the residents and the community and most of all their campaign for justice and them getting their voices heard.
But that was two days of work stopping a Times newspaper um, article going out that we could have been spent getting people's voices heard and trying to get services and trying to work towards justice for these people. They still don't have many of them, still don't have counselling, they still don't have social workers that was ridiculous anybody promising them that they were going to be housed permanently within the first couple of months because it just was never going to happen. Um, and as you know, very few of them have been housed. Um, the counter-narrative, you know, we, we seized the narrative and that was something that we worked on and I've worked with a lot of the residents to do and that is to keep putting their arguments out there in an organised way to keep ahead of the agenda and keep driving forward and, and it's hard working with the media but that's, that was what we did in the initial stages I think was to set the agenda and talk about it on, on our terms um, and really not allow these people to be presented as illegal immigrants and scroungers and, you know, people who aren't worthy in society. Um, and so, well, I don't know what justice looks like. It seems really, really far away for these people. Um, it doesn't look like it's happening for them now. Every stage of everything to do with the inquiry is a fight when these people should be grieving and trying to take their kids to school and basic things like that. Um, and, you know, I think of you guys at Hillsborough and you've been doing this for however many years, 28 years, and it's only, you know, it's a few months and, and we're all knackered. Um, so I'm not as tough as you yet. Um, so... On the, t on the side of the crime stuff, I mean, if you look at the media narrative, um, you see that they've stopped talking about corporate manslaughter. There's been a lot of focus on petty crime. People who've stolen from the building, people who've made fraudulent claims around, you know, around, around um, Grenfell. Um, but they've stopped talking so much in the media about corporate manslaughter. Um, the idea that the state is just and will serve them justice, um, you know, is, is daily disproven. Um, the state here, and we knew and we could see it, the, the local state, sort of at a very close level, is controlled by local wealthy elites. And I think you see that very closely at a local authority level, somewhere like Kensington and Chelsea, where the differences in, in the population there and the inequality there is so huge that you just visually see, you can see, and you can smell the class difference. These people do not socialise with those people. They would never go to dinner with them. They would never sit in the same pub. The closest they've come to those people is as their cleaner, as their taxi driver, as their decorator. And that's going to be the fight, I think. The fight is going to also going to be a political one locally. Um, we'll see. You know, we've got elections coming up. We'll see what the, what the results of this has been politically and whether local people can try and change the makeup of that council. Um, I don't know. It's a, a long road ahead. But thank you.